And so I'm now halfway through my third term. Um, and I will say that, um, you know, even though, you know, a lot of citizens may not know all the details of urban renewal, they definitely know the topics um, that are associated with urban renewal that have happened in the last decade. Um, so I thought I'd like sh throw some of those out there um, because I think they're kind of the starting place for some of the discussions because really the divisiveness in the back and forth with urban renewal in Oregon City has been um, due to what most people would say is some major mistakes in, in how we have done urban renewal or in major mistakes in certain projects that have caused um, concern with the general public um, and kind of a back and forth between, um, you know, is urban renewal a good thing or a bad thing? Um, and unfortunately, I think it's, it's too bad that we actually have kind of come up with this idea that it's either bad or good. Um, it is good if you're using it right, um, but everyone has a different interpretation of what that means. So um, a couple of the things that were controversial early on in my memory in Oregon City was, um, and I actually just spent the last several hours at watching two of the three town halls, <laughs> because I kind of wanted to see what the conversation was in the other two town halls. Um, there's three of them, so I'll go back and watch the other one. Um, but when I started on the commission, the big topic was the new city hall building. And um, that led to a real um, debate in the last decade about whether or not urban renewal should be spent on city public buildings. And there was a huge number of people in this town that thought it was outrageous that we spent money on the city hall building. And the people that um, didn't object to that at least objected to the fact that all the furniture in City Hall was bought with urban renewal money. Um, and that really bothered people. Um, and so, you know, we have, early on it seemed that the city had lost trust with the public in some of the uses of urban renewal. Um, that kind of, um, that kind of didn't go away um, because there was a, a restaurant that the city gave money to to put awnings on the front of their restaurant and, and within a, a short time the business went bankrupt and went out of business and that money was wasted. Um, and so there was a couple missteps in projects that really I think kind of made the public question whether or not we were using urban renewal correctly and keep in mind this is in 2000 you know, eight in 2009 when the city was not financially stable <laughs> um, at all. Um, and so we're in a better place in this city today than we were then. And so the public was, was very much even more critical of our spending um, in that early time on the commission for me. Um, so ever since then, it has been kind of a back and forth. Um, you have the, um, entire urban renewal area that we have in the downtown, which we'll talk about, you know, kind of what that area is. But if you generally think of the big topics in the last 10 years, the rivers development, I mean, you can't have lived in Oregon City the last 10 years and not heard someone cry some foul, um, you know, controversy about Cabela's, if it existed or didn't exist and whether or not it was really real or not. Um, and all of the controversy about building the shopping center down there at the rivers that ultimately fell apart, um, ultimately involved a recall of a city commissioner, um, which a lot of people thought was completely outrageous. Um, and then still sits there empty pretty much with the exception of Home Depot. Um, and then we have the Cove development and project which has been almost as much of a failure um, as the rivers. Um, and so we now have nothing really to say for the Cove development except for a um, apartment complex, um, which originally was supposed to be mixed use and was supposed to be a medical office building, and was supposed to be a restaurant um, and other things that morphed into just downgraded to apartments. And then the second phase of the um, Cove development, which is all kind of falling apart at this point, which was supposed to be 
condominiums and a little bit of mixed use, which kind of had been downgraded to apartments as well. So you had, um, you know, those, all those aspects in the last decade, which really made, you know, a lot of the public, I think, question, um, you know, question some of the projects, question some of the best uses. I will say that I have always been, it's probably easy to tell, I've always been a critic of, critic of the urban renewal in Oregon City. However, I know that we have, since I've been on the commission, done a lot of amazing, great things. Uh, with urban renewal. For instance, um, you cannot, um, and I think I was talking about this um, probably with James and also our city manager just this last week, where, um, you know, with the exception of 2020, we had rebuilt downtown um, and re rejuvenated downtown to a place where we were so proud of it. Um, and really, I thought a lot of us thought, well, maybe we don't need to focus on the downtown anymore with urban renewal because we've basically brought it back. Um, unfortunately, now this year, it's all going away again. Um, and so, you know, we're losing businesses where the downtown is struggling in terms of the association. And so, you know, we really, um, you know, kind of have to rethink, um, you know, what is what has been the good projects and what have been the bad projects um, and then how do we get the public's trust back in showing them that yes there is actually good uses of urban renewal um, but really it's the public's decision to tell us what to do going forward and i think that's why most of the commission and the urban renewal commission had decided to really go through this process um, you know that prior to all of this there was an effort to make all urban renewal projects, um, you know, go to the vote, voters of the people of this town. Um, and then there was a, a measure that limited the city's uh, spending on urban renewal. Um, and that's where basically everything stopped. And, um, you know, that ended up in some court cases. Um, and what ended up re, re, what ended up happening after those court cases essentially was that this is a state program and the city has every right to do it. Now, just because the city has a right to do it doesn't mean they should. Um, and so the question is, yes, the city has a right to do it, but if we now go in response of the voters and just do whatever we want, is that really gonna get buy-in from the people that we need to support it? Um, and most of us on the commission said, no, we, I don't think that's true. I, I don't think we should be forcing an urban renewal project or plan forward if the public is saying stop, um, even if we legally have the right to do it. And so that's really what started this engagement process because I think most of us really wanted a conversation about it, kind of talk about what's good and bad and get public outreach and, and, and get input on, should we close it? Should we expand the district? Should we, we do something completely different? Um, should we be, you know, focus on our projects or what? And that's what, that's why we're here really through this process. And I think, you know, unfortunately, we hoped that this would be a, a bigger out, a, a larger <coughs> outreach to the public. Um, and because of COVID in 2020, we're really struggling with that. And so I, I'm curious to see how we, um, you know, I'm curious to see if we get the reach that we wanted um, and if that's enough information from the public to actually move forward in any, 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 any way that we feel that is supported by the general citizens. So um, I'll leave it at that. That's a lot, but, um, I think it's important to kind of point out some of the projects that people may not know were urban renewal, but know that, okay, oh, I, I knew that happened in Oregon City. I didn't know this was part of this whole conversation. So maybe that kind of sheds some light. We can, you can ask me some questions, you know, about any of those various projects if you want. Um, and I might have a few questions along the way as well, but I'll turn it over now to, I don't know, who am I turning over to? You're turning over to me. Okay, James, go for it. Well, before we um, go any further, since we have a, a number of people online that uh, really don't know uh, a great deal about urban renewal and how it works, and I right. think that's probably where we should start. 
a conversation as to how it works. And, and I'll turn it over to Sam to explain how urban uh, renewal works. And then um, after that, if you could come back to me, Sam, because I've had three experiences with urban renewal in other cities, uh, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks, James. Yeah, so as uh, Rocky mentioned, it is a state program that's authorized um, uh, through the state uh, by statute 457, um, if we want to get really te technical. Um, but, but really, um, what it authorizes is the city to create a specific boundary based on um, a number of different conditions. Uh, there have to be certain conditions to be found um, in an area to actually implement um, and create that district. And then within that district, um, the city can use tax increment financing. Um, and, and really all that means is that uh, the, the, the value, the property values within the district are frozen uh, at the year that the district is created. So in this instance, it's 2007. Um, and any future tax growth um, or growth of those, those property values um, can be captured within the district and, and utilized and used for uh, specific proje uh, projects that are included in the, uh, the urban renewal plan. Um, at which point, um, the whenever it's terminated, whenever the district is terminated, um, and that can be, well, that has to, has to be as soon as the, the city pound pays down any debt um, that is accrued along the way. Um, but typically it's, uh, it, it's anywhere from 20 to 30 years. Um, uh, the values um, and the tax generation then return to the, the taxing districts that are impacted by the, by the district. So, um, that's an important distinction as, as we talk about um, the impacts of urban renewal. Um, it doesn't actually increase taxes, um, increase or decrease taxes uh, for residents. So uh, you might see a line item on your property tax um, sheet um, uh, just to indicate that there is an urban renewal district. Um, but the only impacts that are of that tax increment financing um, piece is for the overlapping taxing districts. Um, and, and what I mean by that, by that is uh, there are uh, several uh, districts ranging from Clackamas County to the city as a district, um, um, to the fire district, uh, Clack uh, Clackamas Community College, the school district, um, that forego tax revenue during the life of the plan. Um, and, and there are some nuances in that as well that we can get into if you, if you um, have questions about those impacts too. Um, but that's the basic premise of how, how, that, uh, how urban renewal works and how it can um, uh, basically leverage economic growth um, for, well, revitalization of certain area um, during, a, during the period of this plan. So. Can you can you see the the screen here? Yes, we, we can okay. see the screen. Because this is this is how it this is actually how it works graphically, or in pictures. Because a picture a picture speaks a thousand words. So when an urban renewal area is established, uh, the tax or there's a baseline for property value, and um, as that property value and as development occurs, the value of uh, of the property uh, is of course taxed and it increases, but this is frozen. But as, it, as the value of the taxes uh, increase, uh, you get to a point where the difference between what's, what's the base and what's maybe here in this area, and as they grow, it goes forward. And as time goes forward, uh, the values continue to go up because the property values keep going up as you hopefully develop more and more uh, in the area. So the difference between the base and as the property values grow and you collect more taxes, in this case, property taxes, this is the increment. And this increment is used, utilized to, uh, to uh, finance debt of, of the growth uh, so that you don't have to go and ask um, the rest of t uh, other people in other parts of the city to contribute. It actually creates it, its own revenue source. It's, so that's the, that's the uh, that's the promise of urban renewal. 
Uh, urban renewal uh, has occurred and is occurring in all parts of the country, in different areas of the country. And um, uh, there are two or three philosophies when it comes to urban renewal. Uh, some, uh, some cities or organizations use urban renewal to finance projects that create a certain kind of amenity, like for instance, putting in a road, city a road or street lights or trees or park benches to increase the quality of life and make the area that might have been blighted look better. And then there's another point of view where urban renewal is used in order to increase investment and greater return. For instance, if a company uh, wanted to move uh, into the uh, into uh, urban renewal area, uh, they very well may need uh, some incentive because what their project may not have enough, um, may not, there may be a gap in, in how they fund that project. So they would look to urban renewal uh, to utilize some of that tax increment to close that gap that they might very well have in financing that project and to make it pencil. And in doing so, you create uh, the promises that uh, based on an agreement, and these agreements should be well structured. Um, jobs can be created, a tax, more tax revenue can be created, and then whatever is built, uh, uh, the developer needs to be held true and close to that intended development. So, uh, uh, so, so therefore there's two philosophies. And then the third philosophy is a combination of both, where you create a, a nice road and you have streetscape and all that type of thing that also brings in new investment. So you have nice amenities as well as uh, very nice, uh, also creating jobs and that company is, all the companies are paying more um, taxes. And, and sometimes, uh, and some of these pictures actually, this is the urban renewal district in Oregon City. And um, so that, that, that's, uh, so this is where the tax increment occurs within these boundaries. And as time goes on, uh, you can see, you know, some of these buildings, some of these buildings uh, have actually were benefactors of urban renewal. And uh, where you had a before situation in, on Main Street, now we, we look more like this. It's unbelievable. So, <laughs> we, we, we do not show those pictures enough. Um, and and I, I think this is a conversation I've ha I have had with numerous people this week where um, people say to us, you know, we haven't accomplished that much. Um, and then you look at pictures like this. I look at pictures of Oregon City 10 years ago, 15 years ago. This town is a different place. It's a completely different place. Um, and the amount that this city has improved, um, and much so because of urban renewal, um, or at least in some of these projects in part, Newman, uh, because this project, for instance, McLaughlin Promenade, Promenade wasn't entirely urban renewal money. It was um, America Recovery Act money. But um, you know, sometimes urban renewal can um, be matched with other other programs or other funds. So, um, you know, you just look at these pictures and see some of the improvements that have been made in Oregon City in the last decade, which is just amazing. So now we'll open it up to everybody else. Any questions? Um, I, I guess I'll ask mine right from the start and just get moved, then I'll let everyone else have the rest of the time because um, I, I will say, like I, I've pointed out, in the, was pointed out in those pictures, I, I think by far the best thing we've ever done in Oregon City is the storefront um, improvements. Um, and we didn't talk about that, but we, you definitely see that in those pictures. The, the storefront improvements um, were basically, um, are basically grants or, or um, um, matching funds that the city puts in uh, with building owners to re re um, vitalize their their exteriors of their buildings. So um, when you drive down Main Street today and see buildings like the Bush Building or the where the living room pub used to be, which is now a, a beautiful office building on the upper part uh, and a restaurant down below, um, basically every block of Main Street has been 
renovated because of urban renewal money. Um, and I think by far that is one of the most beneficial things we have done. Um, and you can just see going down Main Street the impact that has had. As we started having a lot of success with the storefront grants um, or storefront matches, um, we really started saying, well, have we done everything that we need to do with Main Street? Is, is there other, other things that we need to do? And that's what um, started the adaptive reuse um, grants um, or projects, which allowed um, the ability for um, building owners to renovate or do some changes with the interiors of the building. For instance, maybe their, their building was vacant because it wasn't rentable. And, and so what could they do to make improvements with the interior of the building so that a new business would come in and rent that space? Now, we haven't spent as much time with those as we have with the storefront grant and, the, and, the, and even though we have done projects with those, they aren't as visible. You know, they aren't as noticeable when you drive down the street if there's these interior things happening. And I guess my question with that, and, and this can kind of be thrown out there, I don't want to put anyone necessarily on the spot, especially James, but um, in the past when we were doing these projects, um, and so this was very clearly not under James' um, um, leadership. Um, when we've done some of these projects in the past, we would get a project where a, a, a building owner would come to us and say, we're gonna do this and this and this. And in the end, you know, if we do the changes to this, we're gonna be able to get this kind of um, tenant. And then we match that, the project happened, it either didn't, turn out the way they told us it was going to. Either they didn't do all the changes in the, within the interior of the building that they said they were gonna do. Um, and then in the end, the tenant that they said that they were doing all those changes to bring in never came. Um, and, and so my question is, in terms of the storefront grants and these types of building things where we're matching, you know, is it, I, I would assume it's the city's obligation or, or staff obligation to have some way to account for what happens when those plans are not followed through on, if I should say that. Uh, because I, I think in the past they weren't. Uh, um, and we, we definitely were, you know, investing money into projects we thought were gonna be this and they never happened as that. Um, and that, that's been something that really worried me in the past. So I can take um, first step at that, Rocky. Um, it, it's an age old question, right? Um, mm -hmm. how, to, how to make sure city funds or public funds are utilized in a way that's as intended. Um, right. and, and, and we've, We've had these discussions as consultants with other cities where similar development assistance programs have been are, are being considered. Um, most notably, like late, latest one is in Tigard, um, and it's uh, it, it it can be a little bit of a toss up between do we do we provide the money up front um, because perhaps that's a more equitable solution. Um, or is it a reimbursement of some? Yeah. Or, Exactly, or is it a reimbursement? And of, of course, um, the reimbursement piece is the easiest way to enforce that. Um, right. You get what you want, but you may right. not get to that point anyway, because you know if, if, if someone's relying on those, those upfront may, funds, right. then it's a little different. Of course, I think you can, you can kind of circumnavigate that a little bit to get some, um, to, to maybe leverage um, an overall, um, a, well, a, a, an agreement through urban renewal that those funds are coming. So then they have those business owners may have access to capital um, through through sort of traditional lenders or non traditional lenders. Um, but I mean that, that yeah, I mean there is no there is no um, easy answer. I think um, what we did with Target is 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 ensure that there is a sound business plan perhaps in place there are um certain things that um can be demonstrated to the city to to um make sure that the the recipients of some of that those funds 
um, are lower risk, maybe. Um, but but yeah, certainly there's uh, there's a number of considerations, and and I think those programs, um, you're right, are are uh, incredibly important, especially for sort of downtown revitalization and economic development, supporting those business owners and new developments. Um, so, you know, that is one of the, uh, let me come back a little bit just to say that, um, you know, we, we, we're talking about pro like potential projects um, and there are a number of projects in the plan as is, but less than 20% of the funds in the plan as planned in 2007 have currently been used. So we have the vast majority of the, the, the maximum indebtedness, you know, the, the funds that are available through this plan um, are available for the city to use if they so desire um, going forwards. And, and this is just one of many, many decisions that um, the city will be making based on some of the information that we get through some of these kinds of activities. Um, and those options range anywhere from, from closing the district to um, amending the plan with new projects or perhaps new boundaries, um, um, or perhaps with less um, of that funding uh, in the plan to ensure that perhaps it, it closes earlier or something like that. So I just wanted to make, make sure that that was known that, you know, the end goal of these conversations are to figure exactly what the priority should be and, and what the decision is going to be um, and the future of the district. I can, also, I can also say in my past experience in other cities where I managed other, um, we, east of the Mississippi, we call them redevelopment areas. Uh, on this side of the world, it's called urban renewal. But uh, to keep uh, developers honest, so to speak, uh, what we've done and what we've done is actually provide, put it in, in the agreement, clawback provisions, and then release the money in increments in uh, important junctures of the project. And then we'll have a meeting as to, okay, have we accomplished what we, what we said we would do? And if we have, let's go forward and that type of thing. So uh, it, it, you, you don't have to release all the money up at once. Uh, you don't, you, and you can also reimburse, but also you can, uh, you can sort of piecemeal it out as you, as the project goes forward. And so uh, those are another examples. And I, I think it's all a balance because even in the situation where you have a vacant building that you may give some funds to renovate it, expecting a certain tenant, if in the end it's at any tenant, it's better than what it was before. So, I mean, I think there's some ability to say, well, it wasn't exactly what we wanted, but at least it did serve a purpose in, in filling a, a vacant building. And maybe that's worth it. I, I don't know. In, in some cases it might be. Um, all right, let's turn it over to everyone else. I might have a later, later question, but um, I wanna hear if there's any other questions. And, well, I think um, just a couple of ideas and what I look for. James's comments about um, staggering the mount, making sure that progress is happening along the way, uh, gives me a little bit more of a sense of, um, I guess, of relief and idea that the money is going to be spent correctly. My family goes way back in Oregon City, and it's always it's been a small town with a lot of in-boy cronyism. So when Rocky first started on the commission, I think I figured out 85% of the storefront grants went to sitting urban renewal commissioners or one guy that managed all the properties that got them. I, I don't know if your percentage is correct, but... Um... There were, I mean, there there were, I, when I was on the commission early on, there were urban renewal commissioners getting urban renewal grants, yes. Right, and Rocky was one of the people that stood up against that. I'm not trying to just blow his horn, but um, they got that changed, and those urban renewal commissioners left, interestingly. But I think that, you know, the perception of where the money is going and that it's not going into 
part of the usual suspects or part of people connected to the commission um, is important. And then one of, I think part of what we need in this town is we need a variety of housing in um, situations where we have a mix of low income, affordable market rate, not developing slums, but keep a mixture together because we've got a variety of incomes coming in. And we also need living wage jobs. So I would like to see some of that money used more to help develop properties that can bring in um, non-polluting industry. Um, it can be um, office call center. I mean, there are all kinds of options out there. And bring in some money into this, into town um, with incomes. And that's a good way to help Main Street do well too. Um, it's Main Street needs people with disposable income. And the schools, I mean, we've got to be able to make sure that we're not taking too much away from the schools and the police and fire, all of which are struggling financially, to help a building owner or a property um, developer make more money than they would have otherwise, whether they don't need it. So it's my concern is making sure whatever the projects are, we have a really good balance an understanding of exactly what's going where, what it's taking away from, and then educate the public. Um, you know, make, get people on board, and helping them to really understand what's happening. Sam, uh, Sam, William brought up a good point. If you could address it in, in regard to the schools and the the districts that de that depend on um, taxes, uh, could you sort of address that? Sure. Uh, and yeah, as I, I, I think I said earlier on about um, re, as, as we freeze the district um, or the, freeze the, uh, the values in the district, there are a number of overlapping taxing jurisdictions that, that forego revenue and, and um, during the life of the plan. Um, so uh, among those, um, as, as I mentioned, the fire district, the city, which includes police, uh, includes the school district, includes Clackamas County, um, and others, Port of Portland Metro. Um, some some rely on uh, more heavily on on this revenue than others for for operational. Um, but I think, generally speaking, the theory of urban renewal is that were it not for the monies made available to the city for these projects uh this the tax growth rate um that would generate that revenue would be much lower but for the projects um through urban renewal so uh basically yeah i think as as, as james is perhaps indicating with the cursor there um it may be is something along the more like three or four percent of annual annualized growth versus what we would expect is about seven percent of annualized growth over the course of the plan so after 20 or 30 years uh, when the when the plans terminated districts terminated those taxing districts are receiving a much much higher um amount of of tax revenue uh, had it been um, not for not for urban renewal, um, obviously they they have to um, be okay with foregoing that that revenue over a certain amount of time, and, and often um, they they have certain focuses or certain priorities um, that they'd like to see in the plan, such as um, things like higher return on investment or for housing or, or job based growth. Um, uh, but but generally speaking, we we see the payback of averaging around seven um, years. Meaning, if we terminated this in twenty forty, um, if it were an average plan, it would be about twenty forty seven until they actually got back all the lost revenue that they got um, that they foregone that foregoed um, prior. 
uh, and that's an average, it will be plus or minus. Um, and um, as, we, uh, as we talk about individual districts, uh, each one of them operates a little differently. Um, may, um, most have multiple sources of revenue uh, beyond just tax um, revenue. Um, districts like the, the school district and the Clackamas County College or the Cl uh, Clackamas Community College, sorry, actually um, don't see lost tax revenue um, in the same way as others, uh, primarily because uh, that the funding tends to be equalized at the, at the state through different formulas, through state, for, uh, state programs. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's not, they don't necessarily see the same impacts as someone like the fire district. Sam? Sure. Um, on, on that topic, um, because, and, and, and that has been a big argument, and that's why it's come up in pretty much every town hall. Does this take money from schools? Does it take money from, you know, fire department, et cetera, et cetera. So we can kind of say, you know, well, because the school district gets its money from the state that um, we're not really taking money from Oregon City School District. We're taking money from the state and then the state's giving us money back. They're just not giving us. So, I mean, you, it's hard for me to imagine. Let's say someone says to you, well, if the money from Oregon City School District goes to the state school fund, less money is going to the state school fund than would have been before. So when they disperse that money, whether or not they equalize it or not, there's less money there. Um, and so to say, it, it's pretty soft to say, well, it doesn't take money from Oregon City Schools. It just takes money from the state, which gives us back the money and it, there's less of it there. So it's easy for people in Oregon City to say, well, it doesn't take money from Oregon City Schools. Well, it, it sort of does. It just takes it from some the person that's giving us the money. Um, and so I, I think we have to be careful about that. Am I right on that? <laughs> I, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a fuzzy way of telling people it really doesn't affect the school district um, because it does, just not directly. Um, sure, yeah. And I think Andy, um, looks like you unmuted. Do you want to speak to that, Andy? And, and Sam, do you happen to have the slide that um, shows the various uh, return on investment uh, or growth over, you know, longer periods of time, you know, those different rates of return? That might be helpful to share that as I'm, you know, answering, uh, you know, Commissioner uh, Rocky's uh, question. Yeah, I, yes. I think... Yeah, I think you know from a big picture economic standpoint, Rocky, the you know the the answer to you and others that uh, you know you know in the redirect, particularly around school funding, would be yeah. that if not again for urban renewal, and this is showing you know, that you know return on investment, and if there's a way to you know, kind of increase the size of that, thank you. If not for urban renewal, the value within the district likely would continue to deteriorate. It wouldn't be growing at the rate that it's say presently. And you know, with urban renewal, the growth in the urban renewal area is marginally greater than the growth in overall Oregon City, and that's bringing in the Cove project that's bringing in all the stuff that was done downtown. You take away the stuff that you did downtown, you take away the Cove project, the values within that area would be growing at less than the 3% inflationary adjustments, which basically says the area is deteriorating further and becoming more and more of an issue and creating less and less tax revenue for the schools, the dis fire district, the city, et cetera. By so, reinvesting dollars into that area and seeing economic development activity occur, that ultimately is increasing the assessed values and restoring the health of that particular area. And ultimately what you can see through, you know, on this chart is this is the return on investment from 
a healthy district is, you know, very healthy district would be the orange line. If you go out basically 20 years, the return on the money that's being put into, you know, the, the, the public dollars being invested in this area would generate a return of investment to every overlapping tax and jurisdiction of about 18%. If it goes along the way that's going right now, let's say you close the district today, you're at around 10.5% return on the investment. If you go out and do the same thing that's been going on, you know, uh, you know the last 13 plus years, you would still be at that 10, 10 right. rate. And if so, you go to the, the city's growth rate, you would be at about 10%. So as a public investment, if you can get a return of investment of 18%, that's why the state is supporting urban renewal because it does lead to more dollars for schools, for other services around the state, because there's also income taxes that are coming out of these you know, developments, you know, back to William's point, in terms of creating jobs and an economic environment that ultimately creates higher paying jobs, that generate income taxes to the state. So if, again, if, if not for renewal, you would have an area that's blighted, not generating any jobs, ultimately flat or declining revenues for school programs. And yes, you would have those dollars available for police, for school, you know, for other purposes. They just wouldn't be being leveraged very well. Well, I, I mean, I think it's a valid point, but the point is the last 10 years, we haven't done anything. So this orange line is based on the fact that we actually start doing projects, um, right? I mean, if, if it, because right now the cove is still empty, the rivers uh, area and the dump site still empty. Um, so for the last 10 years, we have been taking money from schools. Uh, no, not actually, I mean, I mean, yeah, again, where you're at right now. I mean, we're not getting the return on investment that you're talking about. And I think that's the concern. I, yeah, let me, let me finish, I mean, please. Yeah, let me finish. Uh, you, you have got a return on investment at this point in time. Your ROI would be around 10.5%. You know, you haven't earned 10.5% anywhere else in, in, in what you've done. If it was at the city rate in, in the where the, and I've taken everything from where you are today. You're at 10, about 10 and ROI. Going forward, if you were to continue this, you would go up just slightly above 11%. If you were to go and grow at what the city rate is, you would actually see a decline from your current level. So yeah, to go forward, I, you know, I think, you would certainly hope that the urban renewal district would invest in projects and be more successful than what you've seen over the last several years. But right. I think you also got to recognize you have a very tough situation with some of those areas. I mean, the Rivers Project is a big project. Lots of moving pieces, as you know, with that particular one. The Cove is also a very difficult site. Lots of issues in that. And it's not made any any you know easier with the controversies and the fits and starts and stops and goes and right. so forth. I mean, it really takes a different philosophy, if you will. It's one thing to run a city; it's another thing to run an urban renewal agency. The two are completely different, and you have to put on two different hats. As an urban renewal agency, you're a developer. Well, just to clarify, the, the problems that we've had with urban renewal have to do with the developments and the projects, not the Urban Renewal Commission, by the way. Uh, I'm not saying that it's the Urban Renewal Commission. I'm saying there's the, there, it's a different form of working, right? You're, as a URA, you're a developer. As a city, you're running police, fire, water, sewer, and all those operational type things. So as a developer, right. you are taking risks. You are putting public money at risk. You are trying to help make things happen. And you just have, I mean, it, you know, urban renewal in Oregon City in this particular area is just a real challenging 
endeavor because you, you've got a lot of things going on with, like I said, you know, that, that whole cove site is just a really challenging site. And the rivers, you know, with the, the landfill, a real challenging site, you know, that, uh, you know, in the best of times, they're challenging. And it's going to take, you know, a lot of creativity and support to help make those things happen. And without that, nothing will happen. I mean, I think it's pretty clear to me that without urban renewal, nothing's going to happen on those sites. No private developers got the wherewithal to come in and fix those sites to make them profitable. Right. I just want a quick time check um, and just be respectful of everyone. It is 7.23, so um, I just wanted to make sure we do have time to answer any additional questions from Lisa or Angela or Holly. Um, I know we've been talking a lot and uh, just wanted to open up the floor a bit before we close this down at 7.30. Um, I have a question, and I, I think it's a quick question. What about micro projects? For example, one city block or one particular area, one block in a neighborhood. Are those, is that feasible, even feasible, a micro project? So urban renewal, um, there are a whole list of projects that you can pay for. And I, and I suppose we should have uh, covered this uh, previously, um, but Realistically, you can do anything from um, uh, site-specific projects, and it doesn't. There's no. There's no limitation on how big or small those projects can be, um, but they can. It can range from development assistance projects to public things like public buildings uh, to parks and plazas. But then there's all these other um, infrastructure-based uh, projects as well, which are. Uh, utility infrastructure, streetscapes, uh, pedestrian and bike infrastructure, and other transportation um, infrastructure, a lot of which you've seen in the sort of the before and after. Um, I think the important thing to remember about uh, what the state allows uh, cities to use urban renewal for it is that it's basically capital projects. So it has to be permanent, uh, permanent projects. Um, if you're going to be providing um, grants, for example, like like the storefront grants, um, other grants, they can't be used for operational expenses. Um, so it can't be business operations, but it can be something like um, permanent tenant improvements, for example, a, a, a new restaurant or something like that. It requires pretty significant and costly um, improvements to that building. So yes, there is, there's no, there's no limitation on the size um, uh, of the project that the city can choose to support. It's interesting. Maybe the the uh, Urban Renewal Commission would consider, you know, some of the blighted areas in, within the city, and just a small scale to build up support. Small wins start small. Things that are easy, somewhat easy. Yeah, and Lisa, that's a conversation that I, we've had for a long time. Of why we haven't why we haven't focused on the little lots in downtown Oregon mm -hmm. City that we own, yeah. and, and get some wins before we take on these giant projects that clearly yeah. haven't been successful. Um, and 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 you know, my concern was taking on these big projects right near the freeway that just d deter traffic off the highway and go to a shopping mall and leave. How do we? you know, connect Main Street to those developments and fill in the gaps before we take on these big projects so that it all works. Um, I think they did it backwards. I, I really think they mm -hmm. were focusing on those big things instead of mm -hmm. working from the core out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, 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 I think we lost 10 years doing that. I agree, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from folks in our Zoom room? Just got one more um, comment, unless somebody else does. I think part of what we need to be careful to, and with and with Rocky, what you were talking about, and Lisa, I want to expand a little. We need to make sure that these projects don't harm existing businesses downtown. I'm old enough. I remember when everything was on Main Street. 
And honestly, when my parents were teachers, we couldn't afford to shop in most of those shops. You know, Jack and Jill was above a teacher's pay grade. But then the shopping center went in and a lot of those stores disappeared. And then Clackamas Town Center went in and you look at the shopping center now. Now we're starting to get some of the boutique places and restaurants and stuff back downtown a little bit. But we need, like Rocky said, we need um, urban renewal that helps reinforce and work with what exists, not take away from it. Well, and I think, was it, so Home Depot was partly funded by Urban Renewal, I believe. Was it? Um, um, and look what happened. All of our plumbing stores, all of our hardware stores, all of our lumber stores in Oregon City, which we had multiple of, all closed. We had, we had, we Copeland, lost, we had Kroger. Yeah. We remodeled we lost our the house when I was a kid and we got all of our lumber through locally owned family businesses. Yeah, I think we lost about 10 or 15 businesses when Home Depot went in. So um, yeah. th I think that's a trade-off that you have to think about, sure. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you. All right, um, it is 7.30 on the dot. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, you may have noticed I started recording this uh, conversation a couple of minutes late, so my apologies, but we are hoping to um, package up this uh, audio and video file so that folks can go back and listen to it if you have any additional, um, if you want to loop back on anything that was discussed this evening, um, you will be able to find this loaded onto the website in the next couple of days. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and if, of course, if there's any more questions that you have, um, I know James would be glad to uh, collect those questions or comments um, and then disseminate them out to our team um, and let our urban, our commissioners know as well um, the comments and questions that come in. So, Thank you all for this evening. I thought that was quite productive. Lots of things learned. Um, and really appreciate everyone making the time to join uh, an evening Zoom meeting. So thank you very much. One last thing, Anise. Uh, we do have, please go to the, the project website um, and specifically the Get Involved tab. Uh, there's a survey there. Uh, just a quick follow up. You can feel free to. Um, jot down a few things uh there's there's multiple choice it's not that difficult <laughs> um but uh that you'll find you'll find all in information on upcoming meetings too um and uh so for example this coming monday we'll be presenting to um the chamber of commerce and uh, and the downtown oregon city association um and uh yeah you'll find other meetings too those are great avenues as well for a more formalized presentation. So if you wanted to kind of rewind and just get a bit more of a, a Urban Renewal 101, um, those are avenues where there will be a, a formal presentation um, that you can listen in on. Um, I will just send the link that uh, Sam just mentioned via the chat function right now to everyone. Um, very easy Google search will lead you to this as well, but I just sent it if folks want to click on it and keep it up on their browser. Great. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, everyone. I hope everybody has a great evening. Um, and thanks again, Commissioner Rocky Smith Thank for you. hosting us. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>